this is where we are in the in the architecture remember we talked initially about postgres database server we spent a good bit of time yesterday talking about tomcat that's running the dhs2 instance the way that it's set up and um, how to do basic operations with it so this morning we're looking at the the front end of the system really the the proxy or reverse proxy server um and as you can see in the in in, in my diagram there i've said apache 2 slash nginx there are actually quite a number of different options one can use for the proxy not even just those two but we'll talk a bit about that as well so what is a reverse proxy okay first of all it's interesting i tend to use and people often do tend to use the terms interchangeably a proxy and a reverse proxy technically they're slightly different um reverse proxy i guess this is my own definition so it might not be you know authoritative but it's basically a web server front end which accepts requests from client software out there in the world people's browsers people's android tablets whatever it might be and it routes them to back-end application service which in our case is primarily these tomcat servers running dhs2 but it can be little node.js servers for any kind of web application server that's running at the back end so your reverse proxies function is to take those incoming requests and route them to application servers at the back end as a technically that's a little bit different to what a web proxy is rather than a reverse proxy web proxy traditionally is something which it does the opposite in fact it's the kind of thing that you find in a lot of particularly large organizations enterprises it's a it's a server which accepts requests from the inside of the network so maybe in the university for example when you when you're accessing the outside world from inside the the land in the in the in the university you most likely don't access directly but you go through a web proxy and a web proxy is used for caching it's also used sometimes for for censoring what websites you're allowed to go to and things like that um so yeah when i say proxy and i use I, often people call it the proxy you see even our container we just call it the proxy in fact it's a reverse proxy right it's slightly different to what it's typically described as a proxy but essentially it's something that sits sits in between right typically these things are are are, are written in c often very widely used um as everybody uses proxies for all kinds of things um so battle tested highly optimized for serving very very massive loads um generally speaking when it comes to performance when you're looking at performance problems that you might find it with dhis2 uh, the problem is almost never going to be the proxy right i mean you get big arguments about this proxy can serve a million requests per second and this one can only serve fifty thousand requests per second or whatever it might be but generally those figures are are much higher than anything that we see um i mean sometimes we get some pretty big servers out there i know bangladesh uh, has probably seen some of the biggest loads that i've seen but even there you know it's not netflix right um so the kind of software that we use for proxies are generally more than adequate to deal with the kind of loads that we have so why do we use it I mean, why do we have a reverse proxy well, if we go back to the architecture diagram we know that tomcat is running uh, like a kind of web service here why don't we allow the clients to go with their browsers and just go straight to the tomcat um why put this thing there at all well there's a number of reasons why we do it yeah technically it's not strictly necessary i mean you can we tend to run our tomcat by default on a port like 8080 
Um, but you can configure your Tomcat also to listen on port 80 or port, and port 443 and just go directly to it in your browser. There's quite a few reasons why generally we don't do that. Um, I've just listed out a few here. There's probably more. Um, one is kind of flexibility of routing. If you've got something in front of your Tomcat, um, then your Apache or your Nginx, then you can change out. You can change out your application server, move it from one machine to another, whatever it might be. Um, do an upgrade on one container and then simply flip over the connection. Um, there's a lot of flexibility you get through having it, having a man in the middle. Um, related to that, I guess, is load balancing. Um, what load balancing is where basically your proxy runs one of a number of algorithms um, to decide from incoming requests which uh, backend worker to send to service that request. So instead of having one Tomcat, you might have four or eight or <coughs> whatever it might be configured as a as a, as a team of workers. And um, this way you can horizontally scale. People often ask me about load balancing and why we don't do it um, in, in these tools. It's primarily because um it does add some complexity uh, uh because you've got to manage the state between your different between your different tomcat workers and there's no benefit in doing it unless your your tomcat backends each are, are bringing me bringing more resources to the table so if you have what like what we typically have here a single virtual machine then no matter how many different containers we make inside of it, we still have the same amount of RAM and same amount of CPU that we, that we started with. Um, so it makes sense, it only makes sense to load balance when your um, each of your, your Tomcat workers that you're creating effectively are coming with their own CPU and their own, their own RAM. And in an ideal case, you can scale them up and down. So periods of heavy load, you might have more workers, and periods of less load, you might have less workers. That can be important in scenarios like things like AWS, where you're paying by the, you're, you're billing by the second. Um, you pay more under periods of high load, and you can pay less under periods of low load. Anyway, as I say, I generally don't advise people to jump straight into load balancing just because it is described in the manual and it is supported. It's something that you should jump into after you've explored all of the other performance optimization possibilities and found that on the basis of the evidence of what you've measured and what you've seen, the only solution to your problem is going to be to, to start load balancing because it's a little bit less trivial to set up and manage. The other thing your reverse proxy typically does is what we call SSL termination, right? When you come with your browser to HTTPS, whatever the URL of your site is, um, typically we install the SSL certificate not on the Tomcat, but rather on the proxy. So the SSL connection is effectively dealt with by the proxy, which is generally quite fast. It's C code, it's code that's used in hundreds of thousands, millions of other sites. So it's well optimized. Um, and then typically the connection to the Tomcat is just plain HTTP. <laughs> Again, if you're in a, in a, cloud environment where you've separated separated these functions onto different machines and you're going through your provider's network, um, you might have to have SSL connections between your proxy and your Tomcat as well to make sure you don't have plain text traffic going through the going through the foreign network within our internal world within our containers and our LXD setup. There's no need to do SSL between the, the proxy and the Tomcat. So SSL gets terminated by the proxy. Um, 
proxies again, depending on which one you use, bring a whole lot of additional functionality, right? The other advantages you have by having something in the middle. Um, particularly related to security, there's there's quite a lot of different security features and possibilities you get. Um, which would be more configurable on your Apache or on your Nginx than just talking to your, your bare Tomcat. Um, the other thing is related to cost to, to, if your Tomcat was listening on port 80, um, it would have to be running with root privileges. Um, and we talked about yesterday how your Tomcat basically is a bit vulnerable. And if anybody does succeed in, in, um, attacking your Tomcat and getting access to the server as the user that's running Tomcat. If Tomcat is running as root, which it would have to do to be listening on port 80 or port 443, then the extent of damage it can cause would be much more. Um, yeah, there's a whole bundle of security related things that, that using the proxy helps you with it. You can configure web application firewalls at the proxy level. Um, yeah, there's other things. URL blocking. URL blocking is quite a common thing. Well, it's not so common, but it's something that we do. Um, it's a useful thing to have in your in your toolbox to be able to block access to certain URLs or perhaps block certain types of clients um, as a way of dealing with a particular problem that your server might be might be having the other thing on the pro you can actually rewrite the url the request um the url in the request or other aspects of the request again is something that's sometimes useful to do so you can actually modify what's coming in um before you send it off to the back end rate limiting something we're going to talk about a little bit um if you're Tomcat's getting overwhelmed or swamped by basically too many requests coming from the outside world. Uh, a lot of proxy software have the ability to perform various types of rate limiting or request limiting. Um, we'll talk a little bit about that. The, the, the type of software that you use often determine how much of these different types of functionality that you're going to get. If you view all of these sort of things together, they sometimes are described as virtual patching. Right? One of the things that your reverse proxy is very handy for is reverse is, is virtual patching. I mean, virtual patching basically is you're compensating for some problem with the application perhaps which which maybe has come to the attention of developers developers say they're going to fix it and um, maybe it's going to take them two weeks to fix it uh, maybe it's going to take them two months to fix it but in the meantime your server is falling flat for one reason or another so you need to take some kind of emergency measure you've got to patch it somehow while you're waiting for the real fix um, and your proxy frequently is your is your um, your way out there. The other thing your proxy can do is caching, particularly things like static content. We've got a few issues with caching at the moment with DHS2 I need to figure out before I turn on the caching. But um, yeah, so particularly for things like static files, it's kind of a waste of Tomcat resources to be going to the Tomcat all the time to be picking up JavaScript files and CSS files and things like that. Having got them once, they can be cached at the proxy and that relieves load on the, on the Tomcat for subsequent requests. So yeah, lots of reasons to use a reverse proxy. Um, there's probably more. Um, these, are, these are just the, the prominent ones that I could think of as I was putting the slide together. <laughs> Well, what kind of reverse proxies are out there? Well, quite a few. Right? The, 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 the probably three names that come up the most in this regard are Nginx, Apache 2, and HA proxy. 
um, each of which have got different strengths, um, different weaknesses. Uh, a lot of the, I mean, as people would know, I, I, I've used Apache 2 um, quite a lot. Um, it's still the it's still the default in the sort of DHS tool setup. Um, I've been swimming a bit against the tide on it. I know there's huge demand. People want to use Nginx. Um, but most of the, if you, if you go Googling around on the internet about Nginx versus Apache 2, you'll read a lot of, of fairly unscientific, poorly, poorly research stuff. Um, from a performance perspective, there's actually not very much difference between them currently. I mean, there used to be years ago. Um, but I think it's less about the performance. Probably it's it's more about the familiarity with the kind of configuration um, format. People tend to find Nginx is just more, a little bit more modern, a little bit more easier to grasp, perhaps. Apache 2 configuration is a little bit odd to say the least um it's been around for a long time and maybe it shows it but um yeah so the current implementation is based on apache 2 uh tuzo i don't know if tuzo is on the call uh, tuzo from his tanzania he actually made an nginx version um you st still see the remnants of it is in there Unfortunately, the first the first attempt at that it did kind of break everything else. So so we kind of retired it temporarily. I did tell Tuzo I was going to go back and fix it, and that's that's now six months ago. So yeah, uh, I've got more urgent reasons to move now, um, which we'll talk about a little bit later on. So yeah, we will make an engine X version. Um, it's quite possible to set up a container. I mean, you've, you've seen from two weeks back, I mean, creating containers is relatively straightforward. Um, and when you make a container, you basically just have the equivalent of a, a running Ubuntu machine or whatever other system you want to put in it. And you can install whatever you want on it. And so in practice, um, I've actually put together quite a number of Nginx proxies so using the same setup, but um, just creating the Nginx server manually. What I don't have is an automated script to do it yet. Um, so I didn't want to show you that today because I've been tripped up a few times yesterday being one of them, of trying to do trying to do last minute fixes just for the presentation. So I'm not gonna do it for this, but I, within the next two weeks, um, I'll sort it out. As we as we go through this presentation, you'll see what's involved. It's not really very much. So yeah, the Apache 2 works fine. Um, and big advantage is that it's all managed automatically at the moment, which is which is certainly convenient. Um, and it's it's well tested. But I do understand people also want to people have preferences, um, and also there are there are some benefits currently um, around the rate limiting <laughs> for using Nginx. So yeah, um, as I said, the Apache 2 installation, it's been very well tested. It's, it's only fairly secure, I think. I've done quite a lot of due diligence on it. I would want to do the same with an Nginx version before we released it. Um, and it performs really very well. As I said, the rate limiting module on Nginx is a little bit better. It's still got problems, as I'm going to show you. It's, it's far from ideal, um, but we'll talk a bit about that later on. OK, so how does the Apache 2 get deployed? Well, I mean, you just run that create containers script, and it just all gets done for you, as you, can, as you, as you saw. Um, and the container just comes up and what needs, when it comes up, it's running the, all you see when you log into it is the kind of Apache default landing page on HTTP. At that point, you need to install your SSL certificate on it before you can enable the DHS2 configuration. 
by convention, I guess, I always have it configured with an IP address 192.168.0.2. Right, 192.168.0.1, that's the IP address of the, the host machine. Um, and the proxy is always on two. Now it sh shouldn't have to be like that. It could be any IP address at all. Um, but I've got a number of scripts where I've taken a few shortcuts and just assumed that hard-coded IP. I need to generalize them a little bit. Um, so yeah, for the moment, don't try changing the IP address of the proxy, just assume the proxy is always on zero two. Then everything else will work with it. If you want to put it somewhere else, you can, but you're going to have to make some modifications somewhere else. Uh, the way that requests are forwarded from the outside world into that proxy container, we have not taken a very kind of brute force, simple approach. Um, use the ip tables which is the the kind of built-in firewall within within the linux kernel um again doesn't have to be done that way there are other ways to do it you can do it using lxd lxd has a has a proxy device you can use that's more similar to the way they do it with docker as well um i prefer in some ways just doing it with the with the ip tables um and essentially what it means is these couple of cryptic looking lines here, what is it, six, six or seven lines, six lines. Um, as part of the install script, when you do run your create containers, those six lines get appended to the top of your before.rules on UFW. And that's one of the reasons why you know, a few people have found this already. You try to run create containers, and if you're not running UFW, it's going to fail you. That's partly because um, you need UFW running for these before dot rules to kick in. Um, so otherwise your proxy wouldn't work. You'd have to you'd have to manually create this. The rules themselves, okay, it's not too important. It's it's good for sysadmins to learn a little bit about the way that IP tables rules look like. Um, but you don't have to actually have to do anything unless you're going to change the IP address of your of your proxy. Essentially, the important bits important bits are here. These two oh, these two lines here basically say everything coming in on ETH zero, um, which is using protocol TCP, which is trying to get port eighty. We're basically going to push that instead. Instead of handling it on the host, we're going to take those packets and forward them through to 192.168.0.2 port 80. So if I go with my browser to port 80 on my host machine, uh, effectively what's going to happen is that browser request can be routed straight into the proxy. And we do the same thing with the HTTPS traffic, which is coming on port 443. Okay, so that's that's um, that's the way traffic gets rooted into your, in, into your proxy. So you're looking at it more broadly from the let me flip right back up again. Um, if you look at this whole machine here from the outside, the only three ports that should be open at all ever. So if you if you have an external firewall and you're and you're and you're requesting various ports to be opened, um, all you really need access to is port eighty, port four four three, and whatever port it is we're using. You're using the SSH port twenty two or, or whatever it is. If you've changed it, you shouldn't have any other ports open at all. Right, everything else should be internal to the network. The, port, the SSH port we know about, and anything of port 80 and port 443 is going to be handled by your reverse proxy. Sorry, back to the right slide. Okay, so this is just really a bit of explanation of what's happening under the hood. Um, there's not anything that you need to do about this. Uh, it's worth noting that if you're using a 
a proxy other than Apache, whether it be Nginx or HA proxy or something else, exactly the same thing would apply. We will set it up on 191.6802 and these same forwarding rules would be used to send the request through. Okay, from how is the Apache configured? Well, so by convention again on, on Ubuntu-based systems, now it is possible just to have a single configuration file, but the, by default, the configuration is sort of broken up into sites. And so when you install Apache through the package manager, you find that you've got a list of site configurations sitting under etc. Apache 2 sites available. Um, initially, all you've got is the there's two default sites. There's a default site for for HTTP, and there's another default site if you have SSL enabled. And the way that you enable sites, turn them on, turn them off, um, is effectively creating a what are called in 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 the Unix world symbolic links. You can create a symbolic link from the sites in site available into the site in sites enabled. That's something like, I guess, for Windows people, that's that's like a shortcut, right? You can make a shortcut, basically a link to the other file. Again, if you're doing this with Nginx, it's exactly the same, <coughs> except 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 you've got etc. Nginx sites enabled and etc. Nginx sites available. Apache 2 has got two handy little shortcut commands, um, which I think Nginx doesn't have, which is a bit peculiar, but I find them useful anyway. When you want to turn sites on and turn sites off, um, two, two little command, a, Apache 2 enable site and Apache 2 disable site. Um, I think I've got too many S's in that. I think it's actually a single S, A2E-N-S-I-T-E. <laughs> That's basically what we use to create the symbolic links between sites available and sites enabled. I'll show you a little bit how the script does this. Um, so when you just install Apache 2 with a package manager and you don't fiddle around with any of the sites, then the default site is there by, by default, right? And that just gives you your Apache 2 landing page. We looked at this when we did the installation last last week, right? When you very first install, and then you can go with your browser because the firewall rules are in place. When you go with your browser, you end up at that default site. And that was the thing that I would said was important. You want to test that, make sure you can get to the default site before you attempt to try to set up your SSL. Because if you can get to the default site, it means your networking is basically set up is is working it means your firewall rule is working it means your dns is working um, those are all things you want to test before you want to try to get your ssl sorted after you've tested all of that um again this is what we did at that point you can install an ssl certificate easiest way to do it is to get one from let's encrypt but there are other ways to get an SSL certificate, um, which you might pay for, or you might, some places even have government, have a government CA, which will issue them um, wherever you get your certificate from. After you've installed it, you can then disable the default site and enable your DHS2 specific site. Um, and we saw the other week how, how the little script SSL set up that does that automatically. Might be a good time at this at this point to just quickly review that script. So in light of the explanation I've just given, so you can see again what it does. Am I still logged in here? Sometimes SSH will time out. Not in a very clever place. I just put it here and I'd probably move it to somewhere more sensible. This is basically the script that you need to run after you've installed the proxy for the first time. Um, you can see I've got this bold warning up here telling you, check out now if 
we haven't tested yet. <laughs> um, okay, this thing bars is the configuration file. This is just to set a couple of variables. Uh, you probably vaguely remember this at the start. You define things like your domain name and your email address and your time zone and kind of thing. So they get parsed up there. Here you get the choice to back out if you haven't checked everything you need to check and then off it goes. And it's basically gonna do run these commands on the proxy. You see lots of LXE exec proxy. Stop the Apache server, um, we'll get a certificate using certpot. Um, Disable default site. Um, this is the default landing page you were getting before. And then enable the configuration, which is called Apache minus DHIS2. I'm gonna show you what's inside there shortly. And then restart your Apache server. Okay, so this is really all that happens when you when you install your SSL certificate. We just bring down the default sites, load up the certificates, and then enable the, the DHS2 specific sites. Um, I generally do these steps manually um, because I'm very familiar with them, but I made the little script really for, for your benefit rather than mine. The other thing that we do is the, the Cron job that comes with the certbot package. If you just do an apt install certbot, which is basically what we've done, it doesn't really work very well. I've installed a custom cron here that um, just makes sure that your certificate is up to date. The one downside of these let's encrypt certificates that we get with certbot is, I mean, the great thing is that they're free. The other great thing is you don't have to go through any complicated application process. You don't have to provide a credit card or anything like that. You just need to be able to prove that you own the domain or that you have access to the domain. Um, but the downside is they, they only last for three months. Right? Typically when you buy one, you buy it for a year or for two years or whatever it might be. These free ones, they expire every three months. So you've got to keep checking whether you're getting close to expiring time or when you get close to expiring time, you need to renew. And that's all this little little job does. <coughs> I'm basically substituting the job that was already in there with a new job starting from here, which says at zero minutes past three, so at 3 a.m. every morning, right? Star, 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 we'll just mean it. Every morning at 3 a.m. As the user root, I'm going to run this command. I'm going to say set bot renew. Minus minus standalone means that um, rather than using Apache 2 or Nginx to service the requests, I don't know, I just found it more reliable to just shut down the Apache server, get the certificate, and then start up the Apache server again. Um, we do the same with the Nginx. Now, you might think this is an intolerable service disruption. It's not actually as bad as it sounds. Because what happens with the renew command is that it's going to check, right? It's going to check every morning at three o'clock whether your certificate is within three weeks of expiring. If your certificate is within three weeks of expiring and it needs to be renewed, only then, right? Only then is it going to run the p hook here so it'll stop your apache um it'll refresh your certificate and then start your apache typically that whole process takes about 30 seconds so it means that your once every three months at three o'clock in the morning your apache server will go down for 30 seconds uh, generally speaking i think that's that's adequate and it saves lots of other configuration and fiddling that you might need to do. Um, again, if you're running an Nginx proxy rather than an Apache proxy, this little cron job is exactly the same as just we're going to service Nginx stop and service Nginx start when we start up again. Okay, it's not the only way to do it, it's the way that I do it. Um, Quite important to have that cron job there because otherwise 
yeah, you're going to get complaints after three months. So your users suddenly can't get in because the certificate's expired. Um, if you've configured your if you configured your email address properly, um, I'm trying to get out of here. How do I get back to my windows? I'll do it here. If you configured your email properly at the point where you're applying for your certificate, then Let's Encrypt will send you an email reminder to say your certificate's about to expire. And then you can go in and manually renew it. Uh, but it's much handier. Once you have the cron job working, you can just forget about it. It will simply check every morning at three o'clock for you. And once every three months, it'll just renew it and take care of itself. <laughs> Okay, so, so configuration wise, that's basically what happens behind the scenes. Um, there's not really much you need to do unless you're gonna do this manually. Um, when you run create containers, uh, the Apache server gets set up like that. It's got the, the sites available for use and you need to just set up your SSL before you can enable the site. And that's what the little script does. Okay, so what's in that Apache minus DHS2 configuration? Well, we'll have a look at it after we've gone through the slide. Um, but basically, from from a basic user's perspective, right? Unless you unless you have a little bit of expertise and experience with these things, from a basic perspective, you don't need to do much, right? The configuration is has been done for the most part. Um, we did spend quite a bit of effort, again, like with the Tomcat going through the CIS security benchmarks, kind of like a long checklist, making sure we could tick as many boxes as, as, as was sensible or, or, or possible. Um, so it's reasonably secure, as I tested on SSL labs and just checked again last night, We're still getting an A plus on it. One thing about, about SSL configuration though is that what is secure today isn't necessarily secure tomorrow, right? The world keeps changing. So you can't set up something like this and then just leave it running for five years without re reviewing it because protocols that are considered good now, um, encryption ciphers that are considered good now are not necessarily still gonna be good in a year's time, right? vulnerabilities get discovered, things get modernized. So you do have to review this from time to time. I'm due to give it another review as well. Um, it's probably quite a few things we can still fix up. And it's always great to have um, other people having a look at these things and coming back and making suggestions, things that may or may have forgotten, things which we could do better, etc. So yeah, the main reason you'd ever want to manually edit the configuration file would be to um, implement some kind of virtual patching, right? You've got some things you need to block or limit or whatever it might be, or because you need to update the SSL configuration for, for some reason or another. The actual proxied locations, right? The things that's, that the the, URLs that you are routing through to the backend applications. Again, if you're using the, the deployment scripts and those things are created automatically, when you create an instance, right? You saw us run a few times yesterday, DHS to create instance does three things, right? It makes the database for you. It makes a Tomcat container for you. And the third thing that it does is it goes and creates a little snippet in the proxy to tell it how to route it through to the route of the um, Tomcat container. A kind of ease of maintenance, um, each one of those little snippets end up in their own file. So I created a little directory there called, that's not called uploads at all, it's called upstream, um, etc. But I should fix that now before I forget. Um, I need to get out. Ah, do want to get out of presentation mode. We're, we're going to look at it in a minute anyway. So 
every time you create a new container, you make a new little snippet, and inside that little snippet, it describes the way that um, the way that re requests get rooted to your Tomcat. Just as a kind of little aside, the 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 Moon in Node has a plugin for Apache 2, also has a plugin for Nginx, um, and that also is configured by default. So you can see basic Apache 2 performance graphs on your moon. In. What does that snippet look like? Yeah, I've got one here. Um, so for example, we did create an instance called HMIS, which was running on 192.168.0.10. This is the way a location block looks in Apache 2 which um, will take requests for HMIS and forward those requests to the Tomcat server, um, which is running on 168.0.10. Basically, every time you create a new instance, you create a new upstream snippet like this. Um, the Nginx ones would be fairly similar. The syntax is different, but um, process would be the same. Um, okay, I've made a few little notes here on what's actually involved of if you're doing an engine equivalent to this. Um, I think it requires making a standardized configuration file. I'm going to show you my Apache one shortly. Uh, we need to test it and review it pretty heavily, make sure that um, it's good. But I think they've done so many of them manually now that we're pretty much sure how to do that. Um, we would need to modify DHS to create instance because one of the things DHS to create instance does is it creates that little proxy snippet. Um, so what we'd have to do is to make it a little bit smarter. <coughs> and before it creates the snippet for the proxy, it, need, it will just need to check what kind of proxy is it dealing with. If it's dealing with an Apache proxy, create one like it just did. If it's dealing with an Nginx proxy, just make the, the location block using the Nginx syntax. The other thing that would be slightly different, but really very minor, instead of installing the Apache plugin for your monitor, you'd install the Nginx plugin. I think it's really very easy to do it. Um, it's not rocket science. It'd probably take a couple of hours to get it all down pat. Um, I've been saying this for months, but I still haven't done it. Um, unfortunately doing too many other things, but I'm running out of excuses. So yeah, we'll get this Nginx proxy up and running shortly. <laughs> um, okay, before we do that, let's have a look at what's in the Apache proxy. I don't want to discourage people from using the Apache proxy because um, it actually works very well. Um, once you get used to the Apache syntax, um, it's actually quite powerful. There's very little that you can't do with it. Um, I prefer it in many ways to the Nginx configuration syntax. And the other thing is it's fully open source. It's not like Nginx where you have a free version and a pay version. Mind you, the difference between the free version and the pay version is a little bit less than it used to be. But even so, I think the, the status information that you're getting from the free Nginx is a little bit limited compared to what you get on the free version. Apache is kind of fully free, so you just get everything. Um, okay, let's just at least... Those are, those are the three files that are in your, just list them like this. Hitting the wrong buttons, I need more coffee. This is the file that's sitting inside site enabled, Apache minus DHS2. What you can see in there, um, is that that file is actually, it's not a real file at all. It's actually a symbolic link to the file in sites available, Apache minus DHS2.com. So the real file is sitting in sites available. We can edit it or view it from either place. Let's go have a quick 
run through what's inside it so that we clear away any mysteries. Just check how we're doing on time before I do that. Ah, five to ten. Okay, this is the last thing we do before we take a little break. Maybe we won't even do all of it. Get up to the top of the file. Um, this is what it looks like. Um, one of the first things we do. Uh, the first two things here, turning off. That's basically just turning off information about the about the server that gets sent back to the client. It's kind of basic security stuff. Um, you're basically trying to hide the fact that of what kind of what version of Apache you're using, what operating system it's running on, things like that. Um, SSL stapling cache. This is a slightly weird feature of SSL that's supported by some browsers, not all. I'm not going to go into the detail of it here. I'd recommend you Google it, read on the web page what it does. I've got it in there because, because the CIS benchmark recommends that it's there. I don't think it actually does very much. Um, and I think if I'm not wrong, Google Chrome kind of avoid it. Um, ignores it anyway. Okay, one of the things that we want to do is we want to, first of all, we enable the rewrite engine. You'll see quite a few places in this file where you can make use of something in Apache called mod rewrite. Uh, mod rewrite is probably one of the most powerful features in Apache. Um, allows you to basically yeah, rewrite URLs. And here's a good example of one here. Um, if we get some ancient browsers trying to connect to us using, using um, HTTP protocol version 1.0 or, or, or that, we simply rewrite it, rewrite the request to make sure that um, I know we don't rewrite the request. What we do, we read the syntax correctly. It's going to look at the request and say, this means if the request is not HTTP 1.1, then the rewrite rule that gets fired effectively is F, which is forbidden. So you could probably try this with curl, right? If you try to get to this website using HTTP version 1.0, you just get a forbidden, right? It won't let you go any further. It's HTTP 1.1 or nothing. Um, this, we can ignore for a moment. That's just something that enables the status page so that the monitor can pick up some stats. Um, the virtual host that's running on, on port 80 is HTTP. The most important thing that this thing does is it just takes everything unless they are uh, attempt by let's encrypt to to get to us takes everything and redirects it to https this business all of this stuff here and this thing here i can actually get rid of i don't use it anymore anyway we we just get our our let's encrypt certificates using set standalone but the important rewrite rule is this one so basically all requests coming in on port 80 effectively we're going to redirect them to https so this is where the main action starts here with our virtual host 443 many different ways of setting up virtual hosts you can use name based ip based different ways of of breaking them down this is kind of a fairly simple um, case that we have. Server name, server admin, and self-explanatory. Um, one of the things that is quite useful to do, here I'm checking, I'm checking that, that the browser has accessed this website using my fully qualified domain name. If they've managed to access it through any other way, for example, by just typing in the IP address of the host, then um, I'm just going to forbid them again, right? I'm just going to throw them out. 
Um, there's a good reason for doing that. Particularly, you want to you want to block people accessing your website using using the IP. Particularly with with cloud server, if you go with a big cloud provider like AWS or Linode or Google or DigitalOcean, whatever it might be, those IP addresses that are owned by those big providers, those are all well known. I mean, they're, they're public information. You can find out which blocks of IP addresses are used by Linode, for example. And so one of the things that potential hackers are going to be doing all the time, and they do it all the time, is to be perpetually trawling, going through those IP addresses, looking for vulnerable service. Right, so they might not know the DNS names of everything, but they know all the IP addresses, um, and so they can just scan them. So it's a good idea for your server to respond to anybody trying to access your website, its IP address, by just throwing it out. You'll find quite a lot of websites will do that. If I just try our one, you'll see. Um, so it's li417. Any trouble with using this Linode assigned URL? It's hard to remember it. Um, I have it here. Yeah, so this is this is my my server here. Uh, I can't. Yeah, I'm getting forbidden for some reason. I don't know why that is. And I've done something. <laughs> I go back and see what I've done on that. I think that's. I think I was playing around with the, with the blocking rules. Oh, I completely blocked my way out of that. Yeah, I blocked that one. Okay, so here I can access my website legitimately, right? Using its using its full name. If I try to access this website using its IP address, I would just get thrown out. Um, I don't know its IP address off the top of my head. I'll quickly look it up. Um, what's the IP address? It's well, public IP address. It's this one here. If I try to go to my website, so imagine I am some kind of, of malicious actor. I've got a list of all the IP addresses that are owned by Linode, and I'm now going to check what is everybody running on all of their IP addresses, see if I can find something vulnerable. So if I try to go to that IP address, um, uh, okay, it's throwing me out already because it's throwing me to HTTPS, but even if I accept that, if I proceed to it, it's going to forbid me from getting in anyway. Um, so again, that's a useful thing to do. You should do the same, regardless of whether you're running um, Apache, Nginx, or any other kind of web server for that matter. There is a legitimate way that we want people to be able to access us, and that's via HTTPS, and it's using the fully qualified domain name. If it's trying to get us in by any other way, then we're not interested. We just forbid them, kick them out. Um, stuff around, keep alive. And here's a whole number of little parameters that it's kind of built up over the years. The request timeout here. Um, by default, we got this set as 300 seconds, which is kind of long, right? That's five minutes. Um, most security benchmarks will tell you that you don't want to have that more than 10 seconds, right? Otherwise, you're going to be vulnerable to denial of service attacks because you might have you know you you if you if you allow many clients to connect and remain connected for a long time you very soon saturate all the available connections that you have unfortunately we don't have too much to we've got quite a lot of requests which often take more than 10 seconds so I've kind of set this time out as 300. I'd like to bring it down more. And I think as we make continued improvements in, in performance, I hope that we can eventually bring that lower. This is a little a little um, attack. You can you can read about the URL there. Um, it's basically 
I recall correctly, this slow RS attack, I think it's it's about a client making a connection and then just not proceeding with it, just leaving the connection open. Um, and if you have clients doing enough of that, again, it can cause a bit of trouble with your server. <laughs> this is a useful, a useful header to set. Basically, you're telling you're telling search engines um, not to index and not to follow links to you. Um, okay, hiding in the days of the internet is not necessarily an effective strategy, but it's not a bad thing either. Don't talk about security by obscurity as a kind of a bit of a joke, but sometimes security by obscurity has some benefits. If it's no, it's not to help you against a determined attacker, but it can keep you out of the firing line of the many, many thousands of casual attackers who are just scanning, looking for targets. I mean, if, if we want to find targets, they should do this, and it's sometimes a bit scary. Looking for DHS servers around the world to try and find one to attack. Here's a nice string to look for there, right? If you go to Google, let's go to Google. Um, And so go find me. I don't want to show you how to do this, really, how to find servers to attack. So I'm mainly trying to show you. There's a string. Let's go search for that string. And we find loads of them. Ooh, here's the HMIS in Rwanda. Coming up, top, top search string. <laughs> Amza, I don't know if you're on the call. I need to fix that. Um, that's because you're running an Nginx server there. You're not running my Apache 2 server, right? And the Nginx server is not setting that header. Um, some crowd in Uganda. Same DHIS in Tanzania. Tuzo, I bet you you're running Nginx on that one as well. <laughs> ah, the DHS2 play server. Right. So, yeah, basically that string, that string has been indexed, right? On Google, the search engine. And so if you're gonna, if you search for it, all these sites appear. What I'm doing there is making sure that you're gonna find all of these sites before you find mine, right? Um, I kind of prefer it that way. I'd much rather all of these things get attacked before you attack my thing. So try to keep yourself out of the way of um, search engines. It's not necessarily a bad thing. The only people that really you need to have accessing your health information system is meant to be your health workers and partners. Um, that's what that does. I'm only going to do a, do a few more lines of this and then we take a quick break. This one is actually very important. Um, it has to do with cross-site request forgery. There are some some places in DHS2 code, remember some of this code is quite old, right? I think the first, first edition of DHS2 appeared, or went live around about 2007, maybe, maybe earlier than that, I think the state of Kerala in India. And some of the code's been around then for, yeah, that's 13, 14 years, coming up for 15 years. Um, there are some vulnerabilities. Um, which yeah, we've got a security group within the DHIS2 community that work hard every day trying to knock, knock out vulnerabilities and make, make it more and more secure. But one of the issues we have is around cross-site request forgery. Cross-site request forgery is the kind of attack, um, it's a social engineering attack. You've probably heard about these things or seen them. You know, where people send you dodgy emails and ask you to click on something. Right, and then you click on the thing, thinking that it's going to take you to a picture of bicycles or something like that. But in fact, what it's going to do is going to make an API request to DHIS2. And if you happen to be logged into DHIS2 at the time on your browser, then the cookie will be used. And were you just innocently clicking on something in an email? In fact, what you've done is you've triggered some attack on your on on your server. Um, one mitigation we can do against that attack is that we can we can um, set the same site same site flag which your browser if your browser sees that 
then basically it won't it won't follow links to your site unless it's come from the same site that it's got it from the way it does that is it wherever it sees set cookie see so this is where your session cookie gets set gets set is this going to add to that this is basically a rewrite follow on means take the same line of set cookie and add to the end of it same site equals strict again you can take a look at that on you can look that up same site on uh, Wikipedia or somewhere, they give you a good explanation what it does. STS, this is kind of quite important to set. Basically, this is telling your browser, if it's seen this site before as HTTPS, then if you try to go to it subsequently using HTTP, then your browser should just refuse. Say, nope, um, this site is, a, is an SSL site. Again, this is to protect against kind of mad in, man in the middle attacks. And this is a basic tracking, tracking protection um, of your X-ray modules. Yeah, that was a, just a few, a few basic security settings um, which have been built up over the years. It's not, it's not completely adequate. There's a few more things that probably we should add. It's something that needs to be reviewed fairly. I can uh, review it probably every six months, which is not often enough. Um, just to make sure these settings are up to date. And again, if you have remember, if you have a server that's running in the field, um, you can't just leave it there forever and assume that it's it's going to be its configuration is fine um, indefinitely, right? You need to review it regularly, make sure that you're keeping up with best practices around here to protect yourself against against um, some well known and less well known vulnerabilities again this is a great advantage of having a reverse proxy there it's it's much harder to do this kind of stuff if you're just exposing your tomcat directly to the world proxies have a whole lot of features built in which allow you as you can see here to set custom headers to modify headers to do things with the content um, this is not apache 2 specific you can do exactly the same stuff using nginx one thing nginx is not so good at is editing cookies um, you've got to do a bit of a hack with nginx to do that but anyway you can achieve the same effect hey lads i think that's lads and lasses i think let's take a break for a couple of minutes maybe you guys can accumulate a couple of questions for me if you have on the content and over time um, some updates get made to the app, right? Things get improved. They could be related to security. They could be related to performance, could be related to, to any kind of thing. Um, and the trouble that you have is all the old ones are still out there. Um, and if the reason for doing the updates were related to security or, or related to performance, um, then it's quite important that you, that you get rid of those old ones and make sure the users upgrade. Right. If you're using mobile device management, you could do that automatically, and that's really the proper way to do it. But uh, sometimes it's just too expensive. Um, it hasn't been properly budgeted for, or it's not practical. And so, again, we come back to the poor old proxy as the, the, the weapon of last resort, right, to, to deal with a problem. Um, and I got a simple way of dealing with this one is to say, well, if you know that certain versions of an app are, are, are undesirable, for one reason or another, we can just simply recognize them and block them. And fortunately, this after some discussion I had with the Android team a year or two back, um, the Android team are now very diligent about identifying the version of the app that they're using in what's called the user agent header in the request. I think I've listed a few out here. This is, a, this is an old list that was sent to me by Marta a year or two back. This is the way that the Android app identifies itself as a user agent. All right, this is a string. You'll see this in the log file. You'll see the, the user agent strings that are being used. <laughs> Old versions used to use a string that started with HIS2 like that, slash version, whoops, version 1.1, etc. 
And um, over time, that string has changed. More recently, it's the, the current strings that we look at look like com.dhis2 slash, and then the version of the app here. Um, this is quite an old list. I think the latest version of the app is 2.3.1. I just saw that on the website. Any of the Android team are on here, they can correct me. Um, so what you often find, and I was actually having a look, looking at Ghana just yesterday, um, a lot of Android apps that were deployed years ago are still out there and they're still trying to access the DHS2 server. Um, and there are all kinds of good reasons we might not want that, right? We want to make sure those old apps um, are effectively banned. And yeah, this is the kind of thing that your reverse proxies to be very good at, um, is examining requests and deciding whether to route them forward or not. So you can imagine in this scenario that we have here, we want to make sure that anybody who's using an app version 2.2 or above, right, we'll accept. And anything that's 2.1 or 2.0 or one of these old strings here, we want to effectively ban. We can do that on our proxy quite simply like this. And using, using mod rewrite is the neatest way to do it. There's other ways to do it, in fact, but this is the way I do it. <laughs> the way mod rewrite works is you lay out a list of conditions, rewrite condition, rewrite condition, re and right at the end of that li re list of conditions, you have a rewrite rule that say, well, if, if any of these uh, conditions match, then you trigger the rewrite rule. The rewrite rule is similar to the previous one. Effectively, the F is what's important here. It's not important. Um, what, we're not actually rewriting the URL in this case. We're simply sending an F for forbidden. Right, so if any of those conditions match, we forbid the request. And you can see this, this is, these are effectively regular expression matches. Um, um, anything that starts with DHIS2 slash zero, right, will match all those early strings, um, should be forbidden. Anything that's com.dhs2 slash one or com.dhs2 slash zero or com.dhs2 slash two. Point zero. This one's not right. Then, but I need to escape. Two point zero to the two point one. Um, made, no, made a mistake in my regular expression there. Fix that on the slide. Effectively, you set you create a set of rules here, and if anything matches any one of those rules, then you simply forbid them to to go further. Um, I can test that quickly. I've set I've set up the these very rules on um, HMIS instance on Linode. Uh, do I have them in my history? Let me just check. I don't want to copy them backwards and forwards off the slide. I just want to show you these things in action. Before I do that, I'm gonna. Let me see where I've done it. I've got them under upstream. Here's my HMIS snippet. You see, inside the snippet, I've added stuff, right? It's because it's a regular expression, the dot has a special meaning. I can't just put it to play. Let's just fix it to be dot like that. And so any user agent that looks that matches any one of those strings, we won't let them in. Um, just reload. And let's test it. The easiest way to test it is going to be to um, no problem going in full screen mode. We get out of full screen mode, that's what's causing me trouble. Okay. So if I let's just first of all check the website is working at all. So copy that string. I'm just testing with curl here. Uh back to 
my laptop, do from here. Oh yeah, I was doing them here the other day. Anyway. I, was doing them. I was testing this last night anyway. So let's just check if we can access our site. Oh, we're getting forbidden. We don't want to get forbidden. Why are we forbidden? Don't have permission to access this resource. Hmm. What did I change from what I did last night? This is the only things that are forbidding. Um, forbidding. Oh. Ah, it's because the last or. This one is not an or. Or, 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 and and that's the last one. I'm sure that's the problem. I know what I did there. There was another, there was another string I had, which, right, let's just test again. Yeah, that works if it's just not following. So if I access the website, it'll work, and that's the, that's the login page that's getting that's getting returned there. Right. Um, so I can I can access the website normally. What if I was an old Android? I need minus L on it. What if I was an old Android device? Let me just get the history up here. Let's see. Take this one. Now, one of the things you can do with Kel is you can you can pretend you're any kind of user agent that you want. So this is the user agent string. This header would be set. Okay, so I don't know at what point this thing fell apart. But basically, if I use curl, um, can access this. HMIS application there. What I've done with those rewrite rules is we've blocked, if I try to access it, like this is an old Android, this is what an old Android app would look like. I had a very old one, and I just like said that before, that's actually a new one. Um, these are the old ones here. So something like this. If I try to access it now using an old Android, ooh, let me in again. That should be blocking me. It's not blocking me. You know, I hate doing this. I test everything last night. Everything's working fine. But I fiddle with a few things. Then I break it again. Let's just check my rules here. Anything with EHIS2 a slash zero um, is going to get blocked. And what have I tried? <laughs> I was in D2 slash one. In fact, anything with EHIS2 we can block. We don't need to say anything that's got a user agent that begins with DHS2, that's, a, that's an old style Android. So we'll just block it like that. Kind of quite when you test these rules quite carefully, or you inadvertently end up blocking things that you don't want to block. That's also something that we've seen quite recently. <coughs> Let's try that again. Yeah. So if I try from using any user agent that begins with DHIS2, it won't let me in. That's what we want. Um, similarly, any user agent that looks like com.dhis2 uh, slash, let's have a look at what these strings look like. Um, my previous slide. So this old one here, 1.1.1, if we've got anything with com.dhis2 1.1.1, we want to block that. We basically only want to allow through any request that has 2.2 or above. 2.2 is fine. Hopefully 2.3 is fine. Yeah. So we're blocking anything that's below that. 
So that's a very useful thing to be able to do because otherwise it's it's actually a real problem, right? It's a lot of projects, you know, they <coughs> they deploy loads of thousands of Android apps, but they've no real long-term plan. What they're going to do about it as these apps start to get old, right? As the world changes, um, and yeah, your proxy is a very useful tool for doing that. Uh, the rules I've got doing what you've I've modified the rules slightly from what's on this slide. Let's just go back and make sure that. Let's fix up the slide if there's a mistake on it. Yeah, there is. It's because I had an additional one I was blocking. So it's or, or, or for all of them except for the last one. And these dots, these dots need to be escaped just to make sure you have it correct. Um, so the syntax isn't hard to understand um, it is you don't have to make loads of these things all together like this i mean if you if you want to be really smart you could create much smarter regular expressions that, that you could probably create a single regular expression to to match all of the ones that you want to block sometimes even though it's slightly less efficient to do it like this, it's a bit easier to maintain. You can see them all broken down one, one line at a time. Um, but there are many cases where you want to might want to block certain things. There might be particular, there was another case actually quite recently, a big aggregate server, which also had a bit of events on it and they'd upgraded prematurely to a version 235. And they found that the very few people who were using the events, but they were actually bringing down the server. Um, and the only way to keep it up short term while developers were fixing it was to simply block all, all um, access to API events. And they kept that in place for a week and that kept the rest of the server up and running while the events API stuff got fixed. All right, so lots of reasons to block. This kind of Android case is, is uh, I guess a particularly interesting one because I think it's probably going to be quite common where deployments are made and those deployments eventually get old and you need to have ways of dealing with them. Um, this is using mod rewrite on Apache. I really love mod rewrite. Um, as I say, the syntax is sometimes a little bit odd, but it's really very, very powerful. You can do lots of things with it. If you want a little tutorial, on how to use mod rewrite, link there is quite useful. Um, you can, of course, do the same thing. This is just some of the tests that we've done. This is a good example of what I was referring to earlier as virtual patching. <coughs> um, we're basically using our using our proxy to compensate for issues people didn't think about. Um, You can do the same thing on Nginx. The kind of blocking rules would, would look something a bit more similar to this. Let me go back to full screen mode again. <coughs> um, I think Jaime contributed this. I mean, this is basically a, a kind of list of ifs, um, kind of very similar to my rewrite condition statements in Apache. If your user agent looks like that, again, this is a regular expression. Return 403, if it looks like that, return 403, etc. Uh, you can see how, how by using different variables and different combinations, you can put together quite a sophisticated set of, of blocking rules. Okay, so that's one useful um, bit of skill you need to have in your toolbox. Um, if you have your proxy server, which you will have, whether it's Apache or Nginx, doesn't really matter. Um, you often find that the ability to be able to block certain requests on the basis of user agent or the request string itself or something else um, is useful. Okay, the other thing is rate limiting. I need to talk a little bit about rate limiting. Um, Fact is, whether we like it or not, all applications, whether it's DHS2 or anything else, um, they will have limits. How many parallel connections that 
are actually possible to be serviced and at what rates, right? How many of those connections per second? Um, DHS2, this is going to be primarily determined by how much RAM and how much CPU are available to process those connections. Um, and so if you have a very, very busy server, which is coming under substantial load, um, you can keep increasing your RAM or keep increasing your CPU, whichever one is the one that makes the difference, um, until you reach a point where you can't keep increasing it anymore, right? Um, and then you need to do something more drastic to stop becoming completely overwhelmed. I say this really doesn't matter, even if you're load balancing, the same principle applies, right? You can keep adding additional Tomcat workers, um, but there's a point at which it becomes uneconomical, right? Again, I think this is particularly the case with, with Android or mobile devices in general. One of the things that it's done is it's substantially increased the potential number of clients that you have out there. Right. I mean, traditional DHIS2 deployments, you had people entering aggregate data at the district level, right? A very, very small number of users effectively. That over some years extended a little bit up to the facility level. So you might have somebody sitting with a laptop in the facility sending through monthly reports. Again, traffic not huge. But once you have tracker-based systems and you have them on mobile devices, then the potential rates of requests that you might be getting um, start to become huge. Uh, and sometimes, uh, I, sometimes this can be because of badly written apps misbehaving, sending excessive requests that they don't need to. And sometimes it's simply because you've got uh, a lot of devices out there. Um, so regardless of what your server is running, how much RAM, the CPU, how much load balancing you're doing, you're gonna reach a point eventually where it's, you, could ha you have to protect the server somehow from getting overwhelmed and going down for everybody. And yeah, we, there are some DHS2 API requests which historically um, have had particular performance overhead problems. Um, there are some that still do. A lot of you on this, this session will be familiar with some of them, right? Some, some analytics query requests um, can be a little bit crazy in terms of their resource demands. Posting events, tracked entity instances, things like that um, are sometimes very heavy. Um, we saw yesterday and last week how tools like Glowroot, in fact, are really, really useful for identifying some of these problematic problematic requests that come up. But it's one thing to be able to identify them. Um, it's another thing then to get developers to focus on fixing them as best they can. And then it's another thing again to actually try and do something about it. Right. Um, even if fixes are in the pipeline and in performance improvements are on their way, right? Your server has got to be up today, not in two weeks' time. Right. So it can be important to identify some requests which are causing trouble. In the most extreme cases, you just block them. Right. That's if you just block them, you're gonna you're gonna um, cause some some um, disruption to some functionality of your DHS2 server, but at least you're going to keep it alive. Um, in some cases, you can be a little bit more subtle than simply blocking them and just try to slow them down somehow. Um, and that's really what rate limiting is about. Um, fortunately, uh, I think the situation around performance in DHS2 is starting to take um, some pretty drastic leaps forward. And the, the last few weeks have been particularly exciting to see. Um, I think we can look forward to the release of 234 and 235. I think 235 may be due out today, the next patch release. Um, I actually have some quite substantial performance improvements. Um, that does not... 
quite li quite significantly in fact because people testing back in Oslo are actually using glow root to identify and measure some of the some of the trouble spots um, and starting to knock them on the head so yeah things are getting better regarding performance and I think we can expect over the coming weeks and months things will continue to get even more better but um, yeah the some of the optimizations that we see in 235 and 234 are probably um, the most optimized that we've seen in any recent DHS2 releases. Good to look forward to that. But remember, no matter how good it gets, there's always going to be outliers and there's always going to be a, a problem that you potentially have got a million devices out there um, hammering on your server. So there's always finite limits. So how do we stop the server being brought down by friendly fire, if you like? I mean, this is not a distributed denial of service attack by some, some hostile actors. This is just normal users where there's just too many of them. Um, and making too many requests which are heavy. Well, of course, we use the proxy. Um, we can use the proxy to re restrict the rate at which requests come by. We can use the proxy to restrict the, the degree of concurrency of those requests. We can restrict the bandwidth that um, particular API points have got, etc. And here's where we start to see differences. Um, Apache 2, unfortunately, in its basic application, it's got a fairly primitive mechanism it'll work to keep your server up if it just keeps if it keeps dying but um it's a bit of a blunt instrument you can you can effectively rate limit um your application but it's not very targeted at, at um as if you, it's not it's not a very tunable mechanism for for rate limiting it is possible to do more sophisticated rate limiting using Apache 2 together with modules like Mod Security, um, but the configuration overhead and doing that is a little bit, a little bit um, unreasonable. Nginx does it better. Um, it's got two very nice mechanisms. I say very nice, uh, two two mechanisms which are much better than the Apache ones anyway for rate limiting and and connection limiting um the directives are called limit underscore rec limit underscore on you can read the official documentation on them there i found them actually very useful um, it was my main motivation in a couple of places to remove the apache proxy and put in place an nginx proxy simply because of the rate limiting everything else about apache i preferred but um, better than Apache 2, but it's still not ideal. Um, one of the problems with Nginx rate limiting, a kind of limitation I found, is that you can limit on the basis of a URL. So if you've got a problem with API events, for example, you can make sure you've got no more than 10 parallel connections to API events, and you can make sure you get no more than than 20 requests per minute on those connections. Um, but you can't discriminate between a get and a post. And that's a really weird limit. I don't understand why it is like that, but I have Googled and Googled and asked questions on mailing lists. And it seems that you just can't. You can, you can put a limit on a URL, but you can't discriminate between whether you're limiting a get or limiting a post. And, and that's quite an important limit because often, often the gets might be okay. The problem we have isn't with the gets, but the problems are with the posts. And so unfortunately at the moment, Nginx also proves to be a little bit of a blunt instrument in this regard because we can only limit the, the, the URL. Um, I've started looking around at, a, at other small project projects which are particularly related to rate limiting. Um, and interestingly enough, the Golang community, right? You know, the Go programming language. There's quite a lot of libraries and little projects very specifically aimed at rate limiting. Um, and I think 
probably we're going to find something there that's useful. And one of the most useful looking libraries I came across is this thing called Tollbooth. Is there any programmers out there who are familiar with Go, want to learn Go? A great opportunity here. I think what we probably need to do is to make a little rate limiting, little rate limiting program. We can stick that in between the proxy and the Tomcat, maybe install it on the Tomcat server and make this very DHIS2 specific, right? So that we can very finely tune exactly which requests and which, which request methods, maybe even which user agents and um, configure them with, with tunable limits. It's either that or it has to become part of the DHS2 core code that API points have got rate limiting functionality built into them. So that's where we are currently with rate limiting. Um, at the moment, um, without further investigation, the best you can do if you need to rate limit is probably use an Nginx server. I've got a little example, I think, on the next slide. Um, how you set about doing that. <laughs> Syntax here, yeah, I mean, it's not too complex. Basically, all most of these rate limiting modules and algorithms like make use of something called a leaky bucket, some variation even on the leaky bucket algorithm. People who are familiar with computer science will have come across the leaky bucket before, particularly if you've done computer networks. Uh, principle of a leaky bucket is pretty much like what it sounds. Imagine you've got a big bucket with a couple of holes in the bottom. Um, and if you use the same principle when you're watering your plants with a watering can, right? You've got a bucket load of water that you want to put onto your peas, which are just sprouting now in the spring. You don't want to throw a big bucket of water straight onto your peas because the weight of the water is just going to probably damage the plants. But if you you can pour a whole bucket onto peas if you run them through a watering can so the water is restricted in its flow when it comes out in a little fine spray through the through the holes in the bottom and no matter how much water you put in the bucket um, the rate at which it comes out is determined by by the little holes in the bottom uh, a leaky bucket Algorithm that works pretty much the same with networks as well. You have a you have a bucket. All your network requests come in, come into the bucket, and then they leak out at a controlled rate out the bottom. Um, that way, your server doesn't get overwhelmed, much like your pea plants. Um, the trouble happens when your bucket gets full. Right. Once your bucket is full of water, you can't accept any more bucket, any more water, any more water anymore, or any more network requests. And the size of your bucket is determined. If I look here at the Nginx configuration here, this is the size. This is 10 megabytes, 10 megabytes, 10 megabytes. This, this, these um, zones, which are defined on the top of the top of the config file, right? They essentially determine the size of your bucket. Right, and they have a name. Um, and we've got three different types of zones defined here. First one is the connection zone. This is this is where we gotta use this with with limit con status or with with um, limit con down below to restrict the amount of concurrency. Right, so we create a zone. Now we create the zone. And this is for the whole server. Right, so um, this means basically for the entire server, we can control how much concurrency is on it. Uh, and down here, if my mouse is visible, down here we say limit connection using the zone called DVSCon 75. What this line is doing is basically saying at any moment in time, we can allow 75 parallel connections to this server. If I get a 76th connection, it gets put into the bucket. If I get a 77th connection, it gets put into the bucket um, until my bucket overflows. When my bucket overflows, um, I'm going to return an error code to the clients. And the best error code return is this thing called 429. 
429 is the HTTP code, which basically says that your request has been rate limited. That's useful information to return, maybe at some stage, um, um, if you're a if you're a Android app developer, for example, um, if you get this response, then you could display something to the user, which is different to just saying there's an error on the server. Right? If you're saying that, then then um, what you're saying instead to the user is everything is fine. Don't panic. Go and have a cup of tea. It just happens to be that you're trying to access this server at the same time as 500,000 other people. And so you've got yourself rate limited, right? That's what a 49 means. So DVS con gives you a way of controlling the number of parallel connections. Uh, limit request. Limit request is used to, to limit the request rate, right? And you can do that. You can configure zones differently. Um, there's two types of zones that you see here. One is determined by the the IP, the binary remote address, right? That's the IP of the person connecting to you or the device connecting to you. So what this zone is saying is that for any particular IP address, uh, we're going to allow them 20 requests per minute, per minute. Any more than 20 requests per minute that come in. So if I get a 21st request within the same minute, it gets put into the bucket. Um, you can also have a request rate for the entire server. Okay, these two are actually not very sensible values because you probably would have a, a higher request rate for based on the whole server than you want to have for particular IP addresses. But then within a particular location block, like here we're saying, for example, data value sets, um, we we can apply those those zones. Um, and effectively control the concurrency. As you can see from the syntax here, the limitation is we can't say, um, can you apply those limits for only get data value sets? Or can you apply those limits only for post data value sets? As far as I can figure out, it simply cannot be done. And that's what, that's what the, Various trawling of mailing lists and things seems to say this. Possibly some hacking you can do with maps that might make it work. But as I say, I think we we actually need to make a little a little go program to do this rate limiting um, more flexibly, more DHIS to uh, applicable. Either way, it's an important, potentially important functionality to have. Mm um to protect your server against being overwhelmed and as i say currently the way nginx does this is quite a bit more flexible than you can do out of the box with apache okay